Okay, I'm talking to Percy Rideout today. It's um, April 18th and we're at his home in Yuba City, California. Percy, do you want to talk a little about your uh, units that you were in? And Well, I started, uh, I finished uh, OCS in September, October of 44 and uh, having gone through basic training in California and my orders uh, as I received them after graduating from from uh, OCS school were to go directly to Camp Hale which was uh, had just opened a few months earlier I think. How did you get into the 10th Mountain Division? Well I had uh, I had been <laughs> coaching at Dartmouth uh, that, that spring up until that spring and fortunately, I didn't, uh, just as the season was over, I received my postcard from, uh, to report uh, to uh, Fort Devens. So you were drafted then, I, huh? I was drafted, but at the same time, I knew that I was, uh, I, had, I trusted in, <laughs> in uh, the system that Minnie Dole had set up that I would arrive in the uh, ski troops. So you and, didn't uh, have three letters of recommendation? Or no, all that no. Stuff. And you were coaching I had skiing? I had applied uh, earlier, of course, to uh, the Ski Association, and uh, they had assured me that when the time came that I would get there. Okay. And, and when was it that you went this, to Camp Hill? Well, as I remember getting in there, uh, in either late November or early December of 44. Uh, there was snow and uh, they, uh, they were just forming the 86th uh, Regiment and they had, uh, I was assigned to headquarters and then uh, immediately uh, we started training a new company which was Company B and uh, we started our ski training, our uh, rifle, uh, riflery, rifle range, and all the basic uh, shoulder arms, all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, it was uh, it was interesting. Did uh, you arrive up in Camp Hale in the springtime then? Was no, it? I was no, I I was there in the fall. Oh, I in the fall. arrived in the winter uh -huh. and worked, and we trained through that winter, and then all next summer. Uh huh. And then all the following winter, which was, uh, I believe, the year of the D-Series. Mm. What were your most vivid memories of the training? Well, uh, of course, skiing at Cooper Hill was uh, the only fun we had, <laughs> the most fun we had. And uh, uh, then we had to take, uh, everybody in the company had to uh, pass the ski test or be tested, and uh, that took uh, that took all our time, and we. Uh, but it was we did it because uh, the snow was there, and we knew that next summer we'd be on the rifle range and and doing some some climbing and all those those things. So, did you find yourself training officers, teaching officers how to ski? Uh, not on a regular basis. I did uh, for uh, a short time give Colonel Ruffner private lessons. <laughs> and uh, at Cooper Hill, but mainly we were uh, training with, uh, with groups of men, large groups of men, and uh, uh, trying to get them uh, to, uh, be, to an, uh, an ability of skiing that was, uh, that we, that was uh, uh, what our target was. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And we took a test at the end of it. Now how did you end up being the ski coach for Dartmouth? Well, because Walter Prago was drafted, he was my coach, oh. and I had been at Sun Valley uh, teaching the year of 1940 and 41, and I received a letter in, in the spring uh, that Walter had been uh, drafted, and uh, where did he go? He went into the into the tenth. Uh, eventually, yeah. I don't know where he went initially for basic training, but. Uh, uh, they uh, they said, can you come back and coach? And of course, I hadn't received. Uh, I didn't know when I would be drafted, so uh, I just said sure, and it worked out fine. I got 
got into winters uh, coaching at Dartmouth. Did you grow up skiing? Where did you grow up? In Massachusetts and uh, uh, not the greatest <laughs> ski state in the world, but uh, I learned at an early age and competed in high school and uh, we competed against Deerfield and, and uh, uh, where many of the Dartmouth boys were that I l met later on. Mm. Now you said your favorite memory of Camp Hale was skiing at Cooper, uh, Cooper Hill. What was your worst memory? Well, uh, I guess you could say uh, the D-Series although it wasn't a bad memory. Uh, at that time, I was not uh, assigned to a company, I was assigned to headquarters, so they made me uh, literally a messenger boy from, uh, from battalion uh, headquarters to regimental headquarters. And uh, so, and it was all on skis, so I, I would, uh, all the messages were sent at night so I would do most of my sleeping in the daytime, oh. uh, and then uh, and then uh, carry messages at night. And I would spend one night at, at regimental headquarters and one night at battalion headquarters, and then the next night return and so forth. So I had to, I didn't get lost. I just uh, had to keep track of where the companies were. <laughs> Do you remember feeling the cold? A lot of the men talked about you. Probably no, I re I devised my own uh, theory of cold that there is no cold, and that all you have to do is uh, is not think about it, and it worked. I I would first of all I would not sit too close to the fire, because then it was really cold when you left it, and I would dig a small trench and put some boughs in and lay my sleeping bag down and, uh, and not take my clothes off. I would just lie down on top of the sleeping bag, fully clothed, and wait till midnight when they uh, give me some orders to to uh, take off and, and take to the next, uh, to the higher echelon. Was it hard to fall asleep in that bright sunlight when you're out? No, uh, I didn't actually sleep at night uh, and I didn't really do very much during the day uh -huh. so I didn't get that much sleep uh, and remember that it's dark uh, uh, more hours than it's light mm -hmm. in December and mm -hmm. January. But when you were doing all your night work going from the regiment to yeah. the uh, battalion headquarters yeah. was that, were you in the barracks then, or were you? No, no, oh, no. It was all in the mountains, all, all the in, mountains. in the in deep snow, uh -huh. and uh, and it was like cross country work, which I had uh, done all my life. So I didn't. So mind. about four o'clock, you could lay down for a little bit, and it right. was getting dark, and right. Right. that helped you out a little, right. helped oh, yeah. you out a little bit. Um, what do you remember about your closest buddies in the army? Do you have some? Well, uh, I remember uh, mostly, uh, I had several, but uh, kind of a group, but we would, uh, I remember our ski trips away from Hale, where we'd go to Alta uh, several times, and we to go to Alta we had to uh, leave on uh, Friday night or Saturday night, Friday night usually, and drive all night to Alta and ski and then uh, ski the next day and then drive all night Sunday night to get to get back to camp. But mm -hmm. the problem there was gas and we had to we had to arrange on our way. We had plenty of gas rations, tickets among the group of us, but we had to arrange for stations to be open on the way so they'd be open Sunday night when we came back. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing skiing in Alta, Utah, huh? It was lots of fun, and and uh, uh, we'd all skied there before the before the service, and uh, and we uh, that was our recreation. What was your first thought when you uh, hit Camp Hale when you got there? Well, it was uh, uh, of course all new, and quite different from uh, civilian life. 
uh, I'd only been in the service for three months, four, uh, uh, six months, and uh, still hadn't gotten used to the uh, the restrictiveness of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's nothing else to uh, can be done about it, so uh, you live with it. How about the altitude? Did you notice the altitude quite a bit? It, it didn't bother me uh, because I had spent, uh, uh, well, I spent a summer in the Tetons, uh, above 10,000 feet, and uh, I had, uh, I hadn't skied that high, but, uh, well, uh, I had uh, kept in training and uh, did lots of uh, cross country in college, so. I was in good shape. Sounds like it. What were you doing in the Tetons above 10,000 feet? Uh, I camped there with uh, some friends and with uh, uh, Jack Durrance, who was our guide, and uh, we spent a summer climbing various peaks. Made one first descent there, and uh, uh, it was a very enjoyable summer. Sounds like it. Sounds wonderful. Um, did you have some particular people that you became close to at Camp Hale that you'd like to talk about? Well, of course, one uh, was Ralph Bromigan, uh, and uh, and I point to him because he didn't come back, and uh, he was one of the, uh, of the group of us that used to go to Aspen uh, when we couldn't go, when we couldn't get away long enough to go to Alda. And once we started going to Aspen, we loved it and uh, kept going. And uh, he, we talked about uh, coming back there after the war and so forth. Finally, we got uh, together with Friedel Pfeiffer and Ralph and I and decided that uh, we would come back there and uh, meet after the war and, and do what we could to get something going there. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when did you leave Camp Hale to go to Italy, and, and how did you uh, say goodbye to your family? And we left, uh, well, we had a leave, as I remembered, a short leave, and uh, our family was in Massachusetts. I went back and then reported to uh, Newport News. Uh, of course, you know, everybody was happy to get out of Texas, and uh, so we... Uh, and I was at that time not assigned to a company, I was with headquarters, so one of my jobs was to uh, check the men onto the ship, <laughs> and uh, which wasn't very exciting, but it was, <laughs> uh, it was uh, a job and kept me busy. And we uh, uh, loaded the Argentina, which was an a ex-passenger ship, beautiful, uh, beautifully equipped, and uh, loaded, I don't know how many men on it, but too many men because we had to jam them in mm. <laughs> a little bit. And uh, then we took off for uh, Italy. What were your quarters like on the ship? Well, the, men, the, the company quarters were uh, fairly low in the boat, in the ship, and uh, I don't remember, well, our officer's quarters, we still slept in bunks, uh, tiered bunks and so forth. But uh, we did eat. We were allowed to eat in the dining room, whereas the men had to, had a regular kitchen down below. Did but, you find you were a seafaring man? Uh, yes, I had no problems, <laughs> and uh, there happened to be uh, a dozen or so uh, Red Cross ladies, girls on the <laughs> on the Argentina, so it wasn't an uneventful uh, passage. Good. We had dances every evening on the top oh. deck. Did you have live music too? Sometimes oh, they had live music. We made some music. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't except we were in a convoy and uh, went very slowly. <laughs> uh, we didn't get into any trouble, but it was, as I remember, it, about 10 days to Naples. And what did Naples look like when you got oh, there? Oh, it looked like a mess. It, it was well bombed out, and uh, the facilities were were very poor. 
Fortunately, we didn't stay there very long. Uh, we soon loaded into uh, some Italian uh, boats that uh, took us up the coast to Livorno. And how long did that take? Was that just a day's? That was an overnight, as I remember, oh. and uh, the facilities were very primitive. Can you be more specific? <laughs> Well, I could draw a picture of it, or, or I could give you a word description of it. That the facilities hung out over the <laughs> over the the uh, bow, the bow of the ship, mm -hmm. and uh, right out in the open. Of course, there were no women on board. But mm -hmm. what did you think about all this? How old were you? I was. Uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember, but I was old enough. I mean, yeah. I was uh, twenty. Uh, Mid-twenties. And then what happened when you got to Livorno? Well, we went into uh, preparations and uh, uh, issuance of supplies and ammunition and weapons and all those things. And very soon uh, comp uh, I was assigned uh, to Company F because uh, uh, Lieutenant Sergeant at that time uh, came down with uh, hepatitis and was hospitalized and so uh, headquarters just assigned me said you take over F company and, and that was the second battalion then yes yeah. Yeah. and uh, so the the personnel we knew although I knew a lot of them uh, uh, from skiing earlier before the war and it was a pretty uh, pretty active and very uh, well trained uh, group. How did, uh, I understand that you didn't have any of the equipment that you had at Camp Bale, all the specialized equipment. How did that go over? Well, we knew that, or we heard we were going to get it eventually, so it was just, uh, we did what uh, we made uh, go with what we had, and uh, uh, we had plenty of clothing and so forth. Uh, what we didn't have, of course, were skis and mountain boots and that sort of thing. But we had warm, warm clothing, plenty of it. Did the mountain boots ever arrive? Yes, I believe they did. I don't know. Uh, I never wore them. I wore, uh, uh, I wore my regular GI boots, as I remember, uh, because mountain boots were a little heavy and and uh, I didn't need them every day. But the, and finally we did get some skis. Uh, I ordered, put in an order for some because I had, my, had to send out a patrol every night and in our first position that we occupied. And uh, so I, I got some skis and I sent out the patrols. Where was that first position? Well, I can't, I can't remember the name of the, of the little village, but it was a little village that we, re we replaced uh, British troops that had been there for six months. And uh, we just moved into their positions, which was in, in this village at the bottom of a, of a hill, a mountain, and the Germans were on top, as they usually were, until we, until we, and our job when we eventually was to get them off of there. How far away would you say it was from Riva Ridge? Was it uh, I have no idea because I didn't know where Riva Ridge mm. was until I got to Riva Ridge. Uh, in miles, I don't know. Uh, uh, when you look at a map, uh, uh, they're deceiving because uh, you don't know what scale it is and so forth. But uh, we never, we weren't talking about Riva Ridge because we didn't know uh, the plan hadn't been developed at that time. Um, how long did it take? for you to get from the village to uh, your jumping off spot? Well, Riva Ridge was what? What's the date? February something? February 18th. 18th. And we were, we went into the, uh, into this village uh, in about mid-January. So it was close to a month. We moved several times uh, along the way. Now, there was some training, I guess, going on when you were in these villages where you were practicing skiing and rock climbing. Well, there was always some training uh, at various uh, uh, places in, in, uh, in Italy. 
Uh, of course, there was training going on down somewhere north of Rome. I never uh, sent anybody there or, we, or never went there. And uh, otherwise, we, uh, we felt we were ready to, to move whenever they told us to. Um, how were you feeling at that time? Kind of anxious, I guess, to get moving because uh, uh, it's hard to know what's going on uh, around you when you're in one one place a long time. As far as the other, uh, as to how the war's going, what's going on, and we were anxious to get moving and and uh, get into the fray and and get things going. Um, was this the village that you were telling me the story that you had? No. Dinner with the Padre? No. We should no. Tell, talk about that story when we no. get there. No, that's not for publication. Oh. Okay. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the patrolling that went on in January and February. Well, I only know what went on with, uh, with my company. And we sent out, we were, we were ordered, to, received orders to send out an eight to ten man patrol every uh, night after darkness and to uh, return uh, to uh, collect as much information as they could about the enemy positions and to return by uh, before daylight. Uh, we soon found that if we didn't return before daylight, uh, we got shot at. Were you on skis? Uh, some of the patrols that I sent out were on skis. In fact, most of them were uh, because of the uh, where we were in the village, there was, this, as I say, steep, steep climb right out of the village, right up to the German positions, uh, through uh, a lot of bivouacking involved, but as they got near the top, they opened up into open fields. And that's about, usually is about as far as we got. Uh, we had to get there before daylight, so we could uh, uh, find out where the positions were. Sometimes they tried to, uh, sometimes they would get shot at uh, uh, in the dark if there was noise involved. But the German positions were pretty static. Uh, they weren't, they weren't uh, sending patrols out or anything. Uh, but if you got near these outposts, uh, you'd get into a, a scuffle. How did you? How did the Italians in the village regard you? Well, there were mostly uh, uh, a few women left in the villages. Uh, there were very few men. And the thing that amazed me the most was the the way the Italian uh, uh, sometimes groups, small groups, not never a very large groups, sometimes just a single man uh, would come walking down. Uh, had apparently walked right through the German lines and they let him go and we let him come into our lines. So, and that really amazed me because uh, uh, I can't imagine a war going on where people are walking, civilians are walking back and forth. Did you feel any suspicion that they might be spies trying to check you guys Yes, and, and, we were, and we were instructed to, uh, to uh, uh, talk to them and uh, get what information we could. If they appeared to want to give information, we'd send them back to to uh, uh, to the headquarters and uh, where they'd be questioned. Where were they going? Do you think they were? Who knows? They might have been. Uh, they might have come from uh, miles further north, and uh, or they might have come from just just across the the lines. They just wanted to get out of the way of the fighting. Mm -hmm. knowing that probably we were going to uh, get into some fighting pretty soon. So they just came in, s not in groups, but just single human beings? Singles, one or two sometimes. Oh. Uh, no families? Very very seldom a family because uh, they, they would have evacuated a long time before that. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them came over to get food. People were very hungry then, weren't they? Um, when did you receive your orders for uh, F Company with the River Ridge? When did you find out you were going to do River Ridge Climb? 
Well, I don't remember the... the red lights on now. So how did you find out about Reaver Ridge? And well, there wasn't uh, a lot of notice. Uh, I do remember that uh, Colonel Towns and my battalion commander uh, came down and uh, with a weasel and took me in. Well, we, we went in from Village Yatico, I think it was. And we uh, went in on uh, the trail into uh, Madonna, El Cerro, which was right under uh, our routing, our, our route, which was the left flank or the Route 5. And uh, we got about halfway in and pretty well exposed when uh, there was a little rifle fire, fire at us, so we turned around and went back. But I knew that that was the plan. That was I was to take my company into to uh, Madonna El Cerro and, and, uh, and spend a night before the attack. And how many I, men were in that area? Uh, well, only uh, in, I took, I took 200 men, I took my F company into the, uh, into the buildings there on the night before the climb and then uh, we stayed, stayed in, uh, covered up all day and then went up the, the next night. Did you, what were your feelings then? Were you feeling like, I'm finally getting moving on this, or? No, I wasn't. I, uh. <laughs> I don't think uh, the excitement is a little different. Uh, it's not from uh, uh, getting into action, really. That's, that has to be done. And you do things sort of uh, by instinct and uh, because uh, that's what you have to do. What made them pick you and switch you from um, picking the F Company from 2nd Battalion to do that particular uh, route as opposed to other? Well, F Company had uh, probably, uh, I, I don't want to say this categorically, but uh, uh, it's, it's, okay possible, it. it's possible that it had, uh, and it did have, uh, a larger percentage of, of uh, trained, well-trained uh, men, sergeants, and, and, uh, and privates who had uh, been skiers, uh, some ski instructors, some climbers, and uh, guides, and so forth. Uh, how come they all gravitated to have company, I don't know. But they were there, and uh, it it made them uh, uh, it made me feel very comfortable uh, with a group like that. What was your strategy then for that particular? Well, climb? it wasn't my strategy. It was in order to climb to climb uh, uh, during dark and try to arrive by daylight, and try to uh, in order to uh, have some element of surprise, try to take the bridge. And, uh, and, and destroy or take prisoners uh, from, uh, from the troops that were below, behind the ridge in the valley. I understand there was a sand table model at uh, the headquarters. Was that, did that help you prepare for what the terrain was going to yeah, be? Yeah, and, and just, just uh, when we got there, we could see it, and that's, that was the best that was I remember the sand table, but uh, uh, it's hard to visualize what it really was like. Now, did you send out? There. Did you send out patrols to kind of figure out what the train was like before you no, started? No, uh, we were too well exposed to do that uh, because if anyone left the buildings, we were in direct uh, 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 sight of the ridge. Where the where the uh, outposts were, we did send out a couple of patrols at night on the first night to find uh, easy easier routes across the the uh, creek or the the river below because uh, we didn't want to get all wet and waste a lot of time getting across. Did you recall any pep talks from any officers? Uh, no, I'm. I wasn't a pep talk 
guy, and uh, I don't know, maybe some of the lieutenants, uh, uh, when they got their, in their instructions from me, went back and gave pep talks to them, and, and I'm sure some of the sergeants uh, uh, talked to them and very seriously about this. Uh, but uh, it was not, uh, it was kind of like uh, uh, a football game, but, uh, but not really, uh, I'm sure they took it very seriously. Any messages or um, from General Hayes? Not at that time, no, uh, that I remember. We were, I'm not even sure we were in contact, well, we were in radio contact, but not any direct line because we were so far removed from uh, the headquarters and we were not tied into the 2nd Battalion, uh, I mean, yeah, the 1st Battalion, I mean, in any way although we were to make contact with them, which we did uh, at the summit. Mm -hmm. uh, there didn't seem, looking at pictures of River Ridge, there didn't seem at, in those days to be many trees. Well, I don't, I don't uh, visualize them as, as trees in the sense of huge trees. I'm thinking of shrubbery or bush type things. Uh, uh, I remember grabbing hold of, of things that that protruded from the ground and to kind of uh, pull yourself up a little bit. So the only cover you really had was when you were in the houses yes. and then night. Yes, yes. Can you describe a little bit the climb that you had going on? Well, the, danger, the big danger in the climb was uh, cover was, uh, was taken care of by darkness, but noise was not. And we had an incident which is uh, some other people have written about, know more about it than I did, but uh, where uh, someone uh, lost his helmet and it went clanging down the, the hillside mm -hmm. and uh, everyone sort of froze, held their breath and, and tried to uh, hope that somebody would grab it. <laughs> but it fortunately did not uh, reach, the noise didn't reach the top. What kind of weapons did you take up there? We carried machine guns, mortars, uh, and uh, our rifles. Uh, nothing special. Uh, I think we had a machine gun, uh, a 50 caliber machine gun uh, platoon assigned to us, extra, so that if we got to the top, we could, uh, we'd have ample firepower. So they carried all those weapons up there mm -hmm. with them. I have some people have said that the weapons were not loaded during the climb. I don't remember. We may have given orders to be careful, or certainly to be careful, and we probably uh, some of them were probably not loaded until we neared the top, because uh, they could have uh, something could have gone wrong. So when you got to the top, what did you do next? Well, we uh, immediately uh, uh, we we surprised the the uh, uh, men that were up there. That's for sure. And they were in uh, one of them. I remember was uh, they were having coffee. Could see a little smoke coming out of their snow cave. They were all in snow caves on the uh, on the the deep. Uh, cornice uh, that was on the top and we uh, but we surprised them sufficiently so that there was very little gunpowder or gunfire at the top but they immediately alerted the uh, garrison down below which we could see we looked right down on them probably uh, to 300 yards away and uh, they became our, our uh, that's where our fire was directed. We took some prisoners uh, from the snow caves and on the top. Where were you located when this action was going on? On the, on the bridge, on the corners. I remember, uh, I mean, I had to be there to see, to see these, uh, uh, these, these men, that, these snow caves that were they were in there, about three to four men in each one, as I remember. I couldn't see them all, but I saw the one that was there nearest the, the point where I reached the, 
the summit. So when the garrison down below started shooting, did you take cover in the snow caves? Or no. You were up out there in the middle of the well, we, we took firing positions. We, and flat on the snow, we were pretty uh, invisible from uh, down below, but we had excellent vision on top. I think it's the only time I ever fired a shot was mm -hmm. when I said, maybe I can hit that. <laughs> were you dressed, you were dressed in uh, white? Were you dressed in white then? Or in I can't remember that actually. We probably, having Parkers, we probably uh, turned them. Uh, but the difference between the white and, and, and the light tan, uh, I don't think was that much different. Mm. That's a good point. That's true. Huh? Especially when you're hiding in the shrubbery in the bushes. Yeah. Of course, there's not too many shrubs on top of a no, cornice. No, no, there were none there. The, yeah. There, I don't, I don't remember what the, uh, what the order said. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look them up. Um, what do you think your greatest challenge was for Company F on Reaver Ridge? Well, accomplishing what we did, what, what we did, what we were supposed to do, which was to, uh, and I think the greatest challenge was to remain 24 hours, uh, well, 12 hours of daylight uh, under their noses without exposing without being exposed because we were sitting ducks if we were exposed they could lob artillery right in and blow the whole uh, the whole uh, company up and and the climb up Reaver Ridge was just a scramble so it wasn't really very well it, it it was uh, uh, something that we were used to doing and uh, it didn't uh, it was difficult uh, there were times when, uh, when we would get start slide a little or slip the icy spots. Uh, there were places where we uh, a rock or something that we could uh, or bedrock that we could throw a rope around and, and just uh, dangle it down to help the, those who came behind. And your men were fanned out so that there yes. really wasn't somebody no it wasn't rocks, a single kicked no. on another no, person. No. Uh, they were well well spaced out. Were you able to see the Bellevue operation when it started um, from the top of River Ridge? Belvedere, you mean? Belvedere. No. One, because we came down, uh, we were relieved immediately the next day. So you're really only up there 24 hours or yeah. so? Yeah, and uh, we then ba went back into reserve. Who relieved you? Do you recall? Uh, I doubt if anyone did because we were the flank and we had uh, done our mission. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, well, there were prisoners taken, but they they were further down the bridge. I know quite a few prisoners taken. We were at orders to return, and and uh, I remember there was a a uh, we were alerted that a. Uh, a lift had, was being put up, and if we needed it for evacuation or anything. But uh, I frankly don't remember the trip down. Mm. Was anybody hurt in uh, your particular part of the mission? Not that I recall, uh, other than scrapes and bruises. Some of the 86 did stay on top of Reaver Ridge yes. throughout. Well, not the 86, I think the, I'm, yes, I mean the 1st Battalion. 1st Battalion. Oh, yes. They were there for uh, several days, I think, because they had to maintain that flank for the uh, attack on Belvedere. When um, you've been back to Italy since, since that time, when you look at River Ridge, what do you think now? Well, I only looked at it once, and... Uh, I took my family there. I didn't go on a on, a, on an organized trip, and uh, I took them there. And they had. Uh, I walked up to the buildings that we were in. I noticed there was a little memorial in there in the chapel. And uh, but I soon found that uh, it didn't mean very much to uh, to. Uh, 
18 and 19 year old girls. So we went on to see more of Italy. Did you get any help from um, the Italians in terms of a route up River Ridge or any support from the Alpini or? No, not, a, not at that time. We had Alpinis assigned to us uh, in April on the, on the April uh, uh, campaign. Uh, they didn't last long. They didn't last long? No. Because? Artillery went right into the mules. The mules bolted and the Alpinis bolted and that's the last we saw of them. Um, one of the platoons got stuck up, um, got into some trouble up there and um, my dad, Hank Hampton, went up, climbed up there to help out. What do you think made him do that? Well, first of all, he was an upfront guy and uh, he, he wanted, secondly, he had designed the whole uh, River Ridge campaign. Uh, the 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 strategy of it and uh, and he was uh, I'm sure he wanted to be with it as close as he could and I think he wanted to show that he could do what his men could do. Um, tell me about when you first began to work uh, with Colonel Hampton. Well, he was uh, the officer in charge when I reported uh, from OCS. And to Camp Hale. To Camp Hale. And uh, we got along fine. I think we played poker at night once in a while. And uh, and uh, we uh, might have had a cocktail or two, but uh, he was married. And I, I remember he, I think he had his family in Glenwood Springs. And he would go there along with uh, Bill Murphy, Major Murphy. And so weekends we had the barracks to ourselves if we didn't go to Aspen or somewhere else. How would you? And somebody had to ta had to stay and be on duty, as they say. How would you character characterize him as an officer? Well, he was about as 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 gracious and nice. Uh, an officer, as you could imagine, he never, uh, uh, he had to discipline me once, but it was, uh, it never, it, uh, uh, I, it was not in a violent sort of way. Uh, I Can you share that story? It's a fun I, lo I lost some silverware I, when he appointed me a mess officer for a period. Everyone took, had to take turns at that, and I wasn't very good. I just took over, uh, uh, whatever the previous mess officer had, uh, but I didn't check the inventory. I didn't want to count the fork, knives and forks. But uh, sooner or later they had to be counted, and I was short, and I received <laughs> a letter uh, requesting me to uh, replace the ones uh, that were short. Uh, what we can let. Um, what would you say Hampton's approach was to motivating others, my dad's approach? Well, it was, I suppose, his personality and, and his uh, leadership uh, uh, qualities. He, he just naturally uh, made you feel that you were... Uh, with him or behind him, and that that uh, he he would uh, take care of you. So he was a a bit of a father figure yes, for a lot yes, of the men. Yes, yes, huh? yes. Would you say he was an extroverted guy? No. Uh, he was himself, as I remember him. Uh, he was burly, blustery. Uh, he would uh, he wanted to be uh, in everything. He wanted to uh, uh, be good at everything, and he was. But he uh, he just was a natural, in my opinion, a natural uh, leader. 
Did um, do you think that the eighty sixth had a special um, esprit de corps as a result of its its leadership? Of course, he was he was part of it, and uh, uh, certainly the eighty sixth uh, regiment had uh, many uh, many skiers and and mountain uh, men. And we had a great uh, spirit of corps. We, uh, Ralph Bromagon and Ralph Lafferty and Charlie McLean and myself, would uh, get together and conjure up songs or sing. And and uh, uh, the the uh, there were so many that were skiers, had been skiers, that of course originally a lot of these were in the 87th, of course. But they, as they got spread out into the other into the other two uh, regiments, they uh, they uh, uh, influenced their backgrounds. Not much. Too much is talked about with the the a March offensive. Is more emphasis on Reaver Ridge and Mount Belvedere and Mount Dallas Bay. Can you talk a little bit about after those? Well, the, of course, the, the, the biggest one after that, as far as I was concerned or know about, was the April uh, offensive, which was the entire Fifth Army. And that, there was a lot of preparation in that. I was even flown uh, over uh, the territory on a re reconnaissance. And uh, it was probably uh, weeks in the making because it involves so many units. And uh, it was uh, planned to be the final offensive, and it was. It accomplished its mission. Uh, and I remember it particularly because uh, uh, that was, uh, I was wounded on the, at the outset of it, at the very beginning. And uh, what date was that person? That was April 14th, about 9 or 10 in the morning. <laughs> we, we jumped off at seven, I think. But uh, and and I missed the rest of it, which is. Uh, but my company went on to do accomplish all its missions according to the records, and uh, I was very proud of it. Where were you wounded? Do you recall where, near what town or uh, village? Well, our we were again were the left flank of the uh, of the. Uh, uh, 10th Mountain Division, uh, in, in uh, contact with other units of the 5th Army. And our, our mission, was, the first day's mission, was to uh, mop up the village of Toriusi and to uh, establish ourselves on Rocco Rufino. Uh, by Nine or ten o'clock that morning, we were facing Toriusi, which supposedly had been uh, cleaned up by units of the 87th, in which uh, actually a, a friend of mine was killed there in the process. Would you but, like to mention his name? Uh, Jake Nunemark, who I had uh, known at Dartmouth and coached him the year that I coached. He was a uh, senior that year, I think. But uh, the mop-up was not uh, complete because uh, the, the village being on a hillside, as most of them were, the lower levels of the buildings were not, uh, were not disarmed. In other words, units went through the streets, uh, they went through the, the uh, buildings and the first floor and so forth, but all of them, the ones on the, on the side that were on the hillside, uh, had basements. And that's where the machine gunners and snipers uh, hold up. And it was hard for anyone to believe when uh, we ran into those that they were there because the mission of the, uh, of the uh, unit on our left was to uh, go through the village. Our mission was to mop it up. So they 
do understand they might not get all the, the enemy out of there, and they didn't. Uh, not not their fault, but it was my luck to run in, <laughs> into those who had stayed in the uh, in the basements. And as we moved towards them and got within in rifle range of them, we uh, received heavy machine gun fire and sniper fire. Uh, as I went forward to find out what was going on to the lead platoon, they were <clears throat> spread out in a in a, a ditch, uh, and uh, I asked uh, the sergeant that was uh, there what was going on. He said the lieutenant and his radio man are pinned down. They they went out. They just went through. Went up uh, out of this. Uh, trench, a gully, I guess you'd call it, and uh, they immediately received fire and we haven't heard from them. So I said, well, uh, I said, where is it coming from? And the sergeant stuck his head up and pointed and he received a wound in his neck from a sniper shot. Mm -hmm. So I... Uh, I would have, uh, I said, uh, well, I didn't say anything, I just acted inst instinctively or rationally or whatever and uh, went out to see what the lieutenant, what had happened. And the minute I got out there, I could see he was uh, prone on the ground, he'd been shot, his radio man had been shot, and there was a, another uh, soldier there with him that hadn't, uh, they'd all been shot at, and I didn't know whether they were, what their condition was, so, but I knew that uh, I'd better get down, so I saw a little, a little depression, and I dived into it, and as I raised my head to call to him, and turned my head, and opened my mouth to call his name, a bullet went through, <laughs> and, uh, all I can remember is it, it, uh, it felt like it was a, a, a 10 or 50 pound shell that had hit me broadside. Or another thought I had was it was Babe Ruth swinging his bat and hit mm -hmm. me right on the cheek. Anyway, uh, there was uh, nothing to do then but to get out of there. So I ran back and uh, decided that there was too much firepower there for me to just send uh, uh, 20, 30, 40, or 50 men out. So there. you ran back even to the though trench. You, yeah. Even, yeah, yeah, you were well, wounded. Well, I went in back to the trench. Cheek. And of course, a medic came over and said, You're hit. And I said, Well, okay, but uh, fix it. And, uh, and I said, We're not going to move. I said, Get some machine guns and mortars set up and, and, uh, and uh, get some firepower in there. In the meantime, uh, a message, uh, not a message, but direct uh, telephone lines we had to a battalion headquarters. And uh, <clears throat> Major Murphy came with the, uh, said, uh, come on, Percy, you better get going. Every, uh, the Torius has been cleared. The 87th has moved through there. There shouldn't be any problem. I said, there is a problem. I said, we're pinned down and there's a lot of firepower there and I, uh, I would endanger a lot of men if I, if we expose ourselves and just charge against, charge right into Toriusi. And uh, he said, well, what can you do? I said, I don't know, but I think we've got to send a patrol or something around to, to uh, flank them from, uh, uh, from the same direction, from the uh, other direction. And he said, well, Okay, I'll see what I can do. Came back a little while later and said, uh, it's gone up to General Duff. Uh, and he said, get going. And uh, I said, well, Murph, I can't. I'm not, and uh, besides that, I've, <laughs> I've got a swelled head. I mean, my head is about as big as a balloon feels that way anyway, and he said, okay, I'll send Lafferty down, which he did, and uh, 
we uh, laughed. He, I gave him up. Uh, a group of men to take around with them, and they crawled around for uh, probably took them an hour or two hours to get there. In the meantime, they uh, ran over a minefield that we would have run into also. And uh, Lafferty was hurt. And uh, but they did succeed finally in getting in and uh, getting rid of the machine guns and the snipers. Uh, it was obviously a sniper that hit me because it was so deadly accurate. He had pinpointed my head when I went down into the depression, and the minute I raised it, he was right on me. Uh, the Germans, a lot of times, didn't pay attention to the Geneva Conventions. Was this sniper up in a, in a church tower? No, believe it or not. He was, uh, I don't know, but I'm assuming he was in he was in the basements, because uh, uh, the church tower, if there was one, would have been further away. The basements were the buildings were the closest to us, and the fact that they hadn't been uh, discovered by the uh, unit going through there, uh, I'm sure that they were all in those ba in those uh, basements. They were big windows about oh, uh, openings. The windows had been broken out. They might have even been stables down there, but they were a large opening, but they were concrete because they were on a hillside and they supported the buildings and mm -hmm. they were pretty impregnable. So then how did you get evacuated out there? What happened next? Well, uh, the uh, patrol went around and the company moved on and I stayed there with all the wounded. There was a tiny sheep shed just in back of this, uh, this uh, uh, g gully that we had taken cover in. And I moved back to that where I could set up a radio and, and keep in contact. And the wounded, there was uh, uh, one officer, one of my patrol leaders who was wounded, shot in the leg. He and several other wounded, and we just holed up there, and it was after dark that night before we were uh, we uh, walked out to the nearest aid station, and then uh, and went on from there. Okay, I'm going to stop right there, Percy, because I don't want to run out of tape. No, I have a couple more questions. Talking that was a.